know that time is precious and that you chose that time to spend, you know, uh, in this conversation here. Uh, it, it is, it is, it is highly appreciated. Um, we really want, we really were focusing in on, on hemp today, you know, through Saffron, we are, are looking at this crop and we're seeing the potential that it holds. And we're looking at it holistically in a manner in which is showing both, um, of course, the money that you can make in it, but also it's historic and cultural relevance. Um, and so, and we really want to make sure that the lens in which Shafan is using is a lens that, that is holistic and is showing this thing in a way in which does not take on the, the, the trend that's happening with this crop right now, where it's taking on that spirit of capitalism, where, which, which forces people to the bottom to, to feed a very small percent at the top. Um, so I, I wanted to just start off with that. I'm going to see, can I go ahead and cast this presentation here? All right. So we're looking at uh, hemp, the purpose, the place, uh, uh, the, the history, the purpose and the place for small farmers of color. I said small farmers of color. I know with some people I kind of grind some gears with that one, but what I really mean, Saffron, you know, of course, in the acronym, it says African-American. We're focusing on, you know, black folks, but in particular, you know, uh, all all races outside of uh, the uh, white race. Uh, and this is uh, almost exclusively um, economics when we're looking at the position that we are in uh, as us farmers of color. It is uh, vastly different from our white kind of counterparts. When I, uh, tr I travel uh, with Saffron being the coordinator for the Carolinas, um, and I have the privilege of seeing many, many black operations. And when I cross over into and, and, and see a white operation, you can automatically recognize, you know, where the resources have been put and where they haven't been put. So we're going to start off with the hemp history and understanding this, this hemp aspect. We really need to understand that there is not a place on this planet where this plant did not have a cultural relevance, not one place from the Eastern hemisphere to the West and all of the roots of this plant are linked back into antiquity. So we got to understand when we are talking about this hemp plant, we are literally talking about this something that at one point was, you know, literally the fabrics of civilization. So when we look at these things uh, globally, you know, the cannabinoids, you're going to hear me say that word, cannabinoids, because I really, and something we were focusing on in Saffron as well, we really want to look at this thing holistically, seeing it as a food, seeing it as a medicine, as a textile, and all the purposes that, that it can play. So we're going to look at the family as a whole, because I, in my understanding, I, I see a direct connection between the health of people and the health of the soil. So the health, the, uh, the state of the planet and the state of we are the people are directly aligned. So in looking at this cannabinoids, we're going to say, I, I, if you say what you see here is it says cannabinoids have been around since the beginning of time, an ancient and, and sacred global crop. No, I did not find a document that said that it had been around since the beginning of time. But what I have found is history that has pointed time and time since we have been recording ourselves, we have, had, we have documentation of this plant. It really goes back that far. When you look at it throughout Nile Valley civilizations, which some consider, you know, the oldest, the oldest civilization where all people come from uh, on the planet, we, we found these. We found the the settlements of this crop in the lakes and the rivers. Uh, this was part was so common that when you go into the tombs of the of the pharaohs and also the tombs of the commoners, you will find renditions of this plant different varieties and uh, strands of this plant in the tombs. So it was something that even crossed over an, an economic status, no matter where you, whether you were royalty or whether, whether you were a peasant, this crop played a significant role. 
um, all the way out from everything from paper um, all the way to, to common fibers. Um, in the East, you find, I mean, when you get down to Southern Africa, you'll find a whole lot more of them smoking um, the plant through water pipes. You still find the fiber. You find that they, they used it for medicine, both interior and exterior. So meaning that if you had a burn or something like that, they, they were different sobs and things of that sort that they use. Or if you needed to actually ingest something, there was there were certain medicines for that as well. When you step over into Asia, you find a lot more of this being used in um, the human and animal consumption. A lot of this was used for feed. Some of the farmers in, in which I, I had, didn't hear them in the introduction, but should be hopping on with us soon uh, um, have, you know, operations in which if they can cut that feed price, um, then they'll be, you know, put themselves a little further into, into the green. Um, so, and throughout history, this has been used for that. And then the sacredness in, in the, in the Buddhist monk, the Buddhist monks are out throughout Asia still today and has always used hemp fiber. For uh, for the fat, the beautiful fabrics you see there. Uh, again, fate, uh, paper, lighting, fuel, um, and it's it's interesting to me because when you get to Europe, you notice a, a, a kind of style, a halt here. When you get to Europe, you notice that there was no use for the oil, you know, for the uh, for um, for uh, lighting fuel. There was no use for uh, the smoking pipes. There was no use for even um, the medicine. They were only using it throughout Europe in antiquity uh, for the fiber use. And many contribute this to being uh, how, how Europe was influenced. And that those were the first things that came through. So the question, the question becomes, okay, how do we go from being so dominantly, you know, um, dominantly, uh, such a dominant use of this crop into the criminalization of this crop, in which I title Satan in the courtroom or Satan and his courtroom, because all these things are political. Uh, coming into uh, agriculture, I find myself splitting off from certain groups because they refuse to recognize uh, the political relevance uh, in agriculture. And because of that, I, I couldn't follow them. And looking at, looking at the history of this plant, it shows me just how right I was. You know, um, capitalism and, and colonialism are at the standpoint of why this plant is no longer here. It has nothing to do with the well-being of the people. It has nothing to, to do with uh, efficiency. Uh, all of it has to do with money. All right, so in the 20th century, you began to see the layout of these things largely being taken over by cotton and tobacco. All right, in the mid-1930s, this was outlawed by an act called the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937. So you ask yourself, what is happening So to the point that we get to the point where they want to outlaw this plant? Well, there was several things happening, two of which I want to focus on. One in which, you know, the end of prohibition, the alcohol became, became legal again. So you have an entire department in, uh, in the, for the United States that is now has no work. So they're looking for something that they can charge people with. And then you have a, an exodus of, of indigenous people, Mexicans in particular, and things of that sort, um, out of, uh, of the California area in which they were trying to clean, clean out these, uh, these areas from the people who were already there. And a lot of these people were known to smoke cannabinoids. So they put, it, put publications out, they put uh, movies, whole movies out, propaganda, in which to, uh, to deter people and to kind of get it in the minds of the people that this was a bad thing. All right. And then simultaneously while this is happening, in 1930, there was a machine created. And this machine was critical because hemp was known to be labor intensive. So when you have this, uh, this crop that was known to be labor intensive, even though I can get up to a six foot long uh, fiber strand out of it, um, a lot of work went into it. So this guy created this machine and this machine can literally strip the, uh, the fiber from the stalk while it was still green. So you can, you can literally set this up in a field and be able to, to make uh, a field of hemp turn into spindles of hemp fiber um, within, a, within a day. And what happened is large corporations came, uh, petrochemical corporations like DuPont came through and bought this product and shelved it and then launched what we now know very well uh, um, through our fabrics as nylon. 
So this hemp was the only competitor. It was the only thing that could compete with this nylon, which was a byproducts of our oil and gas and things. So when we continue to look at this thing, I mean, hemp made up two thirds of, 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 all, of all medicines. It was, it was an ingredient, two thirds of all medicines. So now, simultaneously, while we have the criminalization of him of marijuana coming in, we have the uh, the targeting from large corporations to make uh, hemp uh, decriminalized, and then you also have the influx of pharmaceuticals, and which created a synthetic strand of the cannabinoids. And when, once that synthetic strand, which was patent, which was all about we're talking about capitalism here, when this was patent. Um, then, then the hemp was, was criminalized and uh, marijuana was criminalized on, along with it. But, you know, we're dealing with some selfish people here. In times of war, when they, in the World War, World War II came around, they had to, to take off this marijuana tax act because the very people in which they were fighting the war against were the people who were providing the U.S. with the hemp that they needed to, to clothe their, their soldiers, also to put anchors, put, to put rope onto the anchors of their ships. So they started and, and let farmers uh, grow hemp again um, during the World War II. But as soon as World War II was done, you know, a couple of decades went by with President Nixon, he uh, he decriminalized. I mean, he, he criminalized it again, and which was later stamped uh, from by Ronald Reagan as the war on drugs. So I hope I'm I'm linking some pieces here for you because we're dealing with the crop that literally over fifty thousand different uses for it. You can we can use it for like we talked about for medicines. They also have building materials that um, that which people are building houses and things of that sort out of, out of the hemp. Now, one of the biggest things I think is going to be in the future uh, is looking at the plastics and how we can take uh, and how they're making hemp plastics all the way out to I mean, like I said, over a hundred and fifty. Uh, I mean, excuse me, over 50,000 different uses. All right, so if I'm moving a little fast, it's because I'm really not trying to take up much of your time and talking about this, and I really want to open up the dialogue for what we do, but I'm going to do a little shift here, looking at it from a farmer standpoint. So when you're looking at this crop, there are so many benefits along with this crop, and, and I think it's divine timing that we're dealing with this crop now because a large uh, problem that we're having across the United States because we're so engulfed by um, big ag, by um, chemical-based agriculture, um, that you know, soil depletion is a huge problem. So even I, I read the uh, 2018 uh, fertilizer report, and it, across the board, they're expecting for organic fertilizer to spike because it will have to be used by both organic and non-organic farmers just to bring the soil back to life. All right, so when you're looking at this plant, it is a nitrogen fixer, it, um, um, just like a lagoon would be. You know, it, it does give you the biomass uh, that, that, um, that is literally the food of microbial life. You know, it can absorb toxins from the soil. There are places in Europe where they are using this around uh, um, on the lands in, in which they have certain spills and things of that sort and absorbing it. And then they take that, um, they take that, uh, the biomass from that, strip it down to an oil and create fuel from it. And that fuel has zero CO2 admittance. So it is not, and I will put a disclaimer out there and say the process to make um, that, that biofuel uh, is not a completely organic one, but I think it is a huge step to in the right direction. All right. So now let's you know look at the figures and these figures in which I have here, are literally is information in which I have gathered uh, from talking with farmers, um, per, mostly right here in the state of North Carolina. This is what we're looking at now, and in looking at these figures and in stating these figures, I want to I want you to know that these things will vary state to state, place to place, and it also may vary in depending on what you're growing hemp for. We talked about several um, we talked about several different things in which you can grow hemp for. There's hemp for the fiber. There's there's hemp uh, for the uh, CBD oils or for the flowers in which they call them. The streets we call it bud. 
good. Um, so uh, there, 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 uh, and this right here comes off of uh, the um, uh, operations in which grew it for CBD oil. So they were growing for flour. We noticed that we got that the farmers were getting anywhere from fifty to the highest price. I heard a farmer tell me that he got for it was four hundred and fifty dollars a pound. That farmer in particular was growing out of a greenhouse. Um, so, but uh, fifty dollars has been the lowest I've heard from getting from these things. So, um, with the average cost, and this thing, these things may vary. It, um, the average cost may vary for you, depending on you know how much infrastructure you already have have on your land, depending on how much equipment you already have uh, ready, and things of that sort. Uh, how many people do you have already on the team that are willing to? Put in that time because we know that farming is a is a you know pay at the end type deal. Um, so all these things will vary, but the average price in which we which, which my research has has led me to is about five thousand dollars per acre, and that's not in, including the labor. And I would say majority of that money um, is going into your seed stock. So I think that in moving forward, you know, and conversation which we can have after this is you know how can we make sure that we're not dependent on these things that could so drastically vary our bottom line all right so uh just simple math here when, when we do the math we are looking at one healthy hemp plant would give you anywhere between one and two uh pounds of flour uh with up to two thousand plants per acre so it's, it, it is simple, you know, when you're looking at it on one dimensionally uh, from a flat piece of paper, you know, the money is clearly there. But I do want to, to make it very clear in, you know, our conversation and, in, and, and how we move forward that we still, you know, especially as farmers of color, especially as black farmers, we are standing at a point in which we are, can dictate what the next few generations can look like. We're standing at a point in which I feel that we must come together collectively to get this done on a scale and which truly does ripple across generations. Um, we have, in my opinion, a uh, responsibility to, um, to kind of pull these type of things back and if not hemp, then things like hemp to, to pull back into our systems that can pull us up into the green when it comes to revenue, um, that can pull us up into the green when it comes to self-sustainable systems, that can pull us up into the green when it comes to collaborative work and community. So um, that's, that's the piece in which I have here. Uh, I really, really want to hear from you all because I strongly feel that we have the support with Safan, um, you know, as myself, uh, to be able to support the farmers for what they feel is, uh, is the direction in which um, we should be going with this thing. So I really want your voices to be heard here. And I, and I do thank you for that. No. No, I can't hear you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I know we had uh before we jump into questions, we had one other person join us, nine one nine three five seven six eight nine two. Um if you can just give us your name, clearly from North Carolina, but if you can give us your name, you know, your state, your city, um, and you know, whatever the farm organization, uh constellation you're a part of. They'll need to unmute themselves. Oh, wait, I can unmute them. Okay, there you go. You're unmuted. Hi, this is Penobia Stewart from Cedar Grove, North Carolina. Welcome, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Okay. Welcome, Sanobia. Thank you for getting on. Um, yeah, no problem. So if there, uh, let's start with, um, if there are any direct questions for Jason specifically, if you can just say your name, because um, I know some folks are on video with each other, but for the folks who are on the phone, um, if you can just say your name, we can go ahead and create basically a list or a stack. That way you can get your questions in. Um, and then, you know, other conversation kind of generate. You have to unmute. Sorry. Sorry. That was me, uh, Whitney. I'm sorry. There was a, I tried to unmute everybody, but it was a lot of background noise coming. So I muted everybody again. Okay. So, so do, do folks need to mute themselves, unmute themselves manually in order to say their name? Ah, yes. 
Um, if you have a question, if you can unmute yourself, um, let me know your name, and that way we can we can uh, make sure everybody can get their questions answered. You might be muted. You might want to unmute. Hit the unmute button. You want me to unmute? You yes. I hear you now. <laughs> Okay. Hey everyone, it's Marcus Miller with Sankofa Farms. I just had a quick question. I know you mentioned there were some, um, I guess, political reasons as to why hemp was uh, made illegal back in the day. But why is it back now? Is it more? Is it more because of those political reasons, and they see the true money that can be made from it now? And um, and yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep this one as straightforward as possible. Um, I think there's several reasons it's back now. One, in which I think is the most overt, is the shift in pharmaceuticals. Um, organic is a consumer-driven market. It did not drive up from propaganda and other things that are normally how we are, you know, promoted to to do things. Uh, it's a consumer-driven market. It's, it's a market that came up because people began to demand that their food was handled responsibly. And the same is with in the pharmaceutical. A lot of people are going towards more holistic ways or more, more holistic avenues to be able to get through these things. In 2003, uh, the federal government um, patent CBD. All right. This came out of a failure that happened years before where they were actually trying to patent natural plants and they were getting rebellions by the boatload. One that can be, you know, uh, researched uh, quite easily is the neem tree of India and how the farmers of India rebelled against the British government when they tried to patent this tree that they used for several reasons. Um, so they failed there. So what they began to do is tap into a lot of research and that was coming up on their end and patent things in which most people did not know about, which is certain independent strands or DNA and, um, and they patent CBD. And so what you're seeing here across the board is pharmaceuticals is beginning. They're going to start to extract natural things to, and, and pull patents on them. So a lot of what I'm feeling, in, which is the drive is one, it was the end of prohibition that brought the United States out of the Great Depression. All right. And I feel, and I said this way before the, the uh, 2018 uh, tax, uh, I mean, for the 2018 farm, farm bill, I feel that it will be marijuana that is the only thing that has the, the merit to be able to pull us out of the Great Recession. All right, so now that we're coming up, we, we, this is a cash crop that has never stopped, never stopped in a lot of places on this planet, really never stopped in America, you know, um, so, but, but has been controlled by the black market. And now they're trying to tap back into these things for various reasons economically, and also I think it's leading strongly out of the pharmaceuticals um, because of, of their new way of patenting certain independent strands and they know that they will have to come up off these cannabinoids because of all their medicinal properties and on the, on the flip side of how much money they can make off of it. Please. Hey, Jason, this is Tamara in Georgia. So I've been watching um, documentaries about how the market has been developing in California. And one of the things that is surprising is that it actually has been driving small scale hemp and mar marijuana growers out of business because this, the, the, the amount of fees farmers have to pay to get their licensing is averaging around 100,000, I think, a year. And so what we're seeing is that the big corporate investors are the ones that seem to be positioned to take advantage. The small scale farmers are going black market because they don't wanna pay or they're forming cooperatives. So I just wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about your perspective on how small scale farmers need to position themselves in the Southeast as this market is opening up. Absolutely. I think that one, Thing to be said at first first is that one we must be ahead of the curve 
um, that when we're looking at the flux and just like anything, when plasma t TVs came onto the scene, a plasma TV run you could close to $5,000, you know, but as more and more plasma TVs were made, you know, it became less of a thing, the price began to drop and, and the market began to balance. So right now we are at the high end of these things. So this, the, those numbers and things that sort that I just shared, it won't be that way five, 10 years from now. These will be, uh, you know, it'll be almost at, at the rate of a regular crop. So one, we have to be ahead of the curve. Um, two, um, I feel as though that what the African proverb, many hands make light work, is that, you know, we're, if black farmers that I'm in contact with right now are getting calls, you know, from various places warning tons of biomass and tons of the oil and things of that sort. And small farmers could never individually reach this goal. But if we did come together collaboratively uh, uh, under agreements and things of that sort to be able to grow, I think that we could bulk up to a scale in, the, in that 10 year span that we can capture a large percentage. Um, because just like you said already, um, large corporations are already in on this. McDonald's, the Coke brothers, all of them are already in on this. Trump, Donald Trump has his own hemp strand. All right. So they're, they're already um, they're already in on this. So I think that the only way in which we're going to find our ground is from internal organizing, organizing amongst ourselves so that we can um, so that we can uh, see one exhausting the resources that we have. You know, I talked with the farm the other day. He was like, man, we need planners and we need this. And I'm like, listen, I just need you to constantly we be in constant conversation because we know farmers that have these things are willing to share. So if we're going to take this uh, individual, I'm going to get mine, you know, um, I'm, I'm, it's, it, I'm in it for me type type mentality. Um, I don't think we'll we'll we grab it, but I think we will grab it and, and hold it by by his horns all the way through if we can come together collaboratively and and find uh, organizations and possible institutions to be able to aid us in, uh, through this research um, and grow together. And that man, I'm, when I say grow together, I'm meaning all the way through the process, you know, uh, from, from seed, what I say from seed to barcode, all the way uh, through or from seed to sale. Um, so because there are so many ways in which this product can be flipped that you can get, you know, three bottom lines off of one field. You know, um, so, uh, but if we are looking at and if we are targeted, I feel that we target this thing individually, that it's going to limit us and we will never be able to truly capture and hold uh, the percentage of a market in which we will need to sustain ourselves as black farmers. Hey, Jason, this is Tammy in Georgia. Could you speak a little bit on the potential income revenue from the different of the crop, for instance, CBD, stems, leaves, that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, I'm certainly glad you asked. Well, as of right now, um, when you're looking at textiles and things of that sort, uh, and particularly for clothing, those markets are still liquidy. They're not, they're not concrete yet. There's still a lot of place where, a lot of space that can be occupied there. Um, so, um, as the years go on, I think the largest contracts and the biggest strongholds in which hemp will have will not be on the fiber. So I mean, not be on the on the oil so much, but more so on the biomass that you, which you make the plastics and the hemp creek and, and other things out of. Um, so I think as the years go on, you're gonna see those markets increase. Um, as of right now, there are some contracts out there that a lot of them are, 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 are taken up, um, but there are contracts out there for other things, um, such as biomass and fiber. Um, but the large majority of the farmers in which I'm working with and the farmers in which I know all are growing for, uh, for the flower, for the actual bud in which they make, you get the seeds from, they make hemp seed oil, or you get the extract of, of CBD from that oil as well. Um, that's the large um, majority of, of where the market is because, and I'll be 
perfectly transparent here because there there are several ways to sell it. There's several several ways for it to get off. You know, um, with certain groups, you know, uh, they're um, they're working on getting it straight into the stores. You know, um, I personally don't walk into uh, um, a whole food store or a tobacco shop or anything like that and, and don't talk with the owner to see, you know, if they if these things are on the shelves, how well are they going? Um, and what's the, what, where's the space opportunity for those shelves? Um, so as of right now, I would say like, a, like those numbers that you got there, you know, with um, the, low, the low ball being $50 a pound, all of those are flowers. So, and I would say that in, in looking at the flowers, there's still, you know, the stock and things that are left over that you can also use again for biomass and other things. But majority of those things are flowers. Did I answer you? I know your question came in part. Should I answer every part of that? Can I can I jump in there? So so looking at your math, Jason, if you said one plant gives you one to two pounds of flower and you can get buds and you can get two thousand plants per acre, that and you're getting fifty dollars per pound on the low end, then you know, those two thousand pl plants on an acre could get you 2,000 to 4,000 pounds. So 2,000 pounds of bud at $50 a pound is what, 100,000? So you're looking at anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 per, per acre based on your numbers. Am I, that's about right? That's about right. Okay, and thank you. Only, I only had one farmer who is not, I haven't met him personally. I've only talked to him over the phone. He's not a black farmer. He did grow about seven, I think he said eight acres that he grew last year. And he got around about $50,000 per acre, but he sold for biomass. He, so it was, it was him, uh, they literally came and grinded all that down. Um, and it really wasn't a, like flowers and things that sort are more intensive, a little bit more attention you have to pay to the plant. Where you when you're going for biomass and things just like that, um, most of the time once it get above about two feet uh, high, you know it's it's you don't have to worry about any weeds or anything invading, and you kind of just let it go from there. And that's what that was a style that he did, and he was able to get about fifty thousand um, from the information he gave me. He was able to get fifty thousand per acre, but that's the lowest I've heard. That was my question, Jason. This is Bettina with this old farmhouse, Georgia. My concern or my question is, at one time we were looking at, bi when you mentioned um, biomass, we were mm -hmm. looking at growing switchgrass, which is another one that's used, bio biomass is used Absolutely. for. We were looking at it for fuel. But the problem with that became the root system in that was so thick, so dense, that actually when it became time to tear that product up and put in a new um, crop, it was difficulty. It was it was like you had to actually tear up your whole this, because the system was so deep. Now my question is: that, Does that same thing apply with him? How deep is the root system to it? If it's a biomass, I'm assuming it's got a real dense um, root system. Correct. Correct. Um, it has a tap root system that 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 goes quite deep, um, and it is, but the root system most time we especially with switch grass especially with the grasses your, your root system grow out you know it's, it's really an outward motion you know they go down a couple of inches and then it starts just kind of spread from there and uh what you find out with him of course you have some going out but majority you'll see it kind of shade back in and that tap root system kind of narrows down and starts to dig down okay. and actually be, actually becomes a minor all right, and which brings those, uh, you know, uh, deep, um, and which brings those deep minerals and things that so that you don't have in topsoil. It brings those things into the body of the plant. Uh, so it's a little different there because it has a tap root system, um, and and it would vary according to your planting your planting arrangement. If you were growing for fiber or something like that, then you can plant these things. And I've seen farmers do it out of the same machineries that is used to sow sod or to sow hay. All right. And um, so and you can get them real close together, which would give you a real fine stock um, and not much of a body. 
uh, and you can grow them as close as you know to you know an inch apart from one another, like grass. Um, or if you were growing, you know, more separate, like we, like we're doing for um, the oil for the flower, you grow it like six feet apart. You know, every plant has like a six foot diameter um, around it for it to be able to spread out and bush. And they still grow all the way to the upwards of six feet tall. Um, so it's not, I don't think you have a problem um, when you're looking at um, the harvesting of it. And one, another thing I would like to add in there is that a lot of this equipment is still being invented. Uh, like this equipment does not exist on the large scale, even in places where it didn't um, leave. Um, they're still using, in a lot of ways, very um, ancient technology to be able to harvest these things. Or there is a humongous combine that comes and harvests two, three, four hundred acres at a time. But the problem they're having with this is that because Hemp is also used as a, um, you can use, they're using hemp to make glue. And when you are harvesting hemp um, while it's green, this glue latex material begins to jam up the parts to combine, and which is causing them big problems. So what they're having to do is to treat it like, like they do the corn and things. So it's let the field dry completely out and then go in and, and harvest it. Um, but there's a lot of things that come to place with that. You know, there's a lot of pieces that have to, to have to kind of come in order with that, you know, when they're looking at mold and pests and things of that sort that happens, you know, in this drying process. If you had too much rain, you can almost forget it, you know. Um, so things like that, in which are becoming a, um, which, which the technology and things of that sort will still have to be built. And I would say in North Carolina, we're even um, talking um, with some people who do work, you know, have, have a past of, of building equipment and things of that sort and seeing in which ways can we fashion our own equipment to be able to, uh, to do these type of things um, and pull that innovation to, through for the next generation. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay. Very well, thank you. <laughs> Jason, this is Whitney J. Um, quick question. So Please. for a small scale producer that is, um, you know, wanting to get into hemp production at a super small scale, um, can you talk about what that current like input process looks like? Um, I know I, I, I've heard and, and, and been in conversations with people who are, um, you know, buying starts from some of the, the nurseries Carolina to get started. I know some folks were having hold up to research. So can you talk a little bit about what like what what the process for getting started looks like um, from the scale from the perspective of maybe somebody who's just doing a, a small scale? Right. Well there's there's a couple of options. I guess the two most overt ones that I can kind of pinpoint or is like and I'm, um is like whether you're growing for seed or uh, I mean from seed or whether you are growing from the clones. All right. So um on from seed, um the prices have dropped in some places. Um as of last year, they were going for ridiculous sometimes. Some people were actually playing three or four dollars a seed to be able to get started. Um, and all the way down to a dollar a seed. Um, there, it dropped, it's dropped a little now, um, in which you can kind of fish to be able to get that. Um, I'm, I'm finding, you know, um, I'm finding prices as, I think the, the lowest that we found was, was close to around, for a pound of seed, was like two, three hundred dollars. Um, so, but if you are growing an acre, it, it'll take only about 14, if you, and you're drilling that acre in by seed, go to 14 pounds, um, I mean, from my, from the research, and maybe some of the farmers that are on the call can kind of speak to this as well, uh, from the research, um, it, it's paying about anywhere from 14 to 20 pounds of seed, all right? So, there's the growing from the clones, and then there's the growing from the seed, the clones are running anywhere from six to eight dollars a clone, you know. But what we are finding, how we are finding our ways around this, um, in the with the farmers that I'm working with now, is we're we're kind of sectioning it off in research, where certain sections are like, hey, we get you come in, we're gonna drill seed in here, 
and we're just going to cater to these and things of that sort. Certain sections, we say, okay, we're going to try out our cloning technology, see how good we are, because we're going to be making our, we got a little little greenhouse here, or a little, what, what, we, um, what we're looking to use are worm tunnels, which, are, which I would like people to research. Um, they're much more inexpensive than a, a, a high tunnel would be, um, which are worm tunnels in which we can have those mother plants under, in which you make take clippings and we plan on plugging in the field in places where the plant was weak or a deer got to it or things of that sort. Um, so I, I'm really, what I would recommend for a small scale is that you try to do as much on the ground as possible. Try to get your hand on some seed and, and see if you can either, you know, start a couple of mother plants and and there's, there's a lot of information out there, and I can aid you in, in getting more information on uh, how you, the cloning process. Um, and you can easily uh, just start up because we plan on starting a lot of our seeds in pots, you know, for those mother plants. Um, so you can do that, and you can put those mother plants straight into the ground. You don't have to clip them, you know. Uh, so, uh, so I, I would say to to start off with, with just a few plants and some pots, and just transplant them in and see and see what you can get out of that. Um, and but but it's still when it comes to flower, those are the two methods in which I'm seeing the most. And I would like if there's a farmer up here that uh, I know, I, I think I heard uh, Mr. Owens. I know you farmed um, hemp last year. Um, to kind of speak to what what your process was if you open to it, and uh, and tell us uh, and what 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 you would do different this year that you didn't do last year. Are you still there, Mr. Owens? What's his first name? David. Uh, no, I think, I think David dropped off. Okay. Well, I know Mr. Owens, I, I went to Mr. Owens just, just yesterday, and a lot of where they think that they, you know, a lot of what they felt that they went wrong, um, well, didn't went wrong, but something they would do different, is they would try a lot less varieties. They tried eight varieties on probably under two acres last year. Um, so um, he said they would narrow that in and really look at... Um, crops that are, are ready for, in particular here in the Southeast, where we get uh, like flexes of a lot of rain, crops that can take that moisture and humidity. They said that I'm getting a lot of reports back that saying that the seed out of Colorado and the type of environment that they're coming out of, they're not doing very well here in the Southeast. Um, but the, the seeds that are coming out of like Oregon, Washington places where they get a lot of rain and things that sort are doing much better. Um, um, so, uh, so I would, I would look at that. If I was looking at a small scale, I would really recommend that you start, of course, there's a licensing process, but you start by getting, getting those, um, uh, getting those seeds and just really, um, if you're talking about really small, I will keep them in pots, um, and, um, and, and just growing, which is more than possible. It makes for a, a situation in which you can kind of move them in, move them out type deal where not even a, uh, if I was doing real small, I would go all pots. Uh, and, and just keep them there um, because if a storm came, you can just put them in the shed for that night and bring them back out, something like that. So, um, but that, that's what I have there. I know Lorana had a question next. Um, I'm going to jump in. Kind of follow up to that. Um, I'm in South Carolina. There's legislation that's passed our house that might go to Senate that lifts that requirement or changes how the permitting is structured here in the state. Um, right now, there's, our, there's only 40 applications that were approved last July-ish that um, are only allowing those 40 in production. That looks like that'll change. What kinds of steps as far as preparation can small farmers be doing at this point in South Carolina? And then the other real question is, what's the vision that you have of what this would look like to be able able to allow small farmers to get into this particular area of agriculture and be able to thrive? What would that look like? If I've got a couple of acres that I can put in production, am I able to even maneuver this space by myself? Um, what's this picture? Is it co-op? Is it how, how are you seeing this play out so that we can afford to be able to come into this game and be profitable? 
Absolutely. Thanks for that question. I think the long term is cooperative building um, in long term in which we're going to have to capture. And this is this is the thing that we've been talking about. I know that the Barker said they were on the phone. It's a conversation that we had as well. That is one thing with some farmers that we helped over over the over the fall. It's one thing to be able to to obtain a market, to, to find where a market is and get them to buy from you. Right. And then it's another thing to actually maintain a market so after i get them buying from me to keep it up to bulk so i can constantly tap into this market in a way that i can i can hold it you know um and that's what we're gonna have to do what i feel we have to do we'll we have to be able to capture a market capture the market and hold it and the only way we're gonna be able to hold hold it with the um the size of the market is currently is is that we do it together um, so I, I think that in ways in which you can get ready for it, I really am, am encouraging farmers to look at their entire system, not just hemp, not just the implementation of hemp, all right? Because what hemp does ultimately, you know, for the ground, like we went over before, are the things that we're doing through cover crops, all right? So I would say look at your system as a whole and, and, and let's see in which ways in which you can tighten that system to make it more self-sustaining. Um, I think that'll be a wonderful way to, to get ready for it. As of as when it comes to how how do we how do we get into and hold this market? Ultimately, I think it is a, a I think it is a uh, cooperative uh, that we, we that we will have to form um, to be able to make sure that the farmer you know has time to be able to know where his markets are and then so and also have time to be able to be in the field and make sure he gets a good crop out of it. You know, um, so yeah. That. Did I answer your question? Okay. So just to take a pause for the folks on the phone who um, who might want to jump in, if there's any. Anybody who has any questions or, or comments based off of your own experiences um, to add? And everybody is unmuted. You're free to speak. So this is Courtney Austin Wilson from North Carolina. And many of you I hear are already farms and cooperatives and things of that nature. Can everybody hear me? Jason, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. My question is, I, I haven't applied for the hemp, the hemp application or the pilot program. Has anyone actually filled out this application that's on the phone? And was it something that we have a, we have a pre-existing farm? I'm, I've just recently moved back home to my, my homeland and um, we have a farm, we did a, my grand, my great grandfather did a tobacco allotment years ago. I'm on the same land that my family's had since the 1800s. But I, I have a farm number, but I have not a part. I have not applied for the the hemp license. Is that something that your farm had to generate ten thousand dollars in the last year or tax years? How did that work for um, individuals on the run? Jason. No, nah, yeah, I'm still here. I was, I was waiting to see if anybody else um, had did anybody, any. yeah, did anybody have any any experiences with filling out the application? Um, and the ten thousand dollars was that a thing for anyone? So, I haven't, I haven't heard. I, I know someone. I've guided two uh, individuals to through the application process. And um, I have not heard that ten thousand dollars piece. Um, okay, okay. It's not my first time hearing it. I mean, I I have not bumped into that piece. Now I'm not okay. sure because of the records in which they put in through their um, schedule left, which will have to be put in for the application. I'm not sure is that automatic. If they automatically fail into it because of that, um, because of the information right. they put in or not. Um, but it's, it's not, it's not something that I, that I've heard farmers, oh, I didn't have that $10,000 piece, so I couldn't, 
you know, put in my application. I haven't heard a farmer tell me that. Okay, okay, because I do know I'm a, I qualify as the bona fide farm, a bona fide farm. Mm -hmm. So that was a, that was a part I've read on the application. So I just wanted to know if it was a, if that was going to be a, a wall that I would have to face or not, especially with them saying that it had to be um, pre-existing tax forms. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, hi, video. Hi, this is Joan. I have a question uh, regarding how intensive is the care for the crop? Um, I heard that you mentioned a few things about uh, how much acreage you needed, but how much, what are the other things other than acreage, like quality of soil, mate, regular maintenance? What are the things needed to produce a good harvest? Well, the lucky thing about this hemp is that it's, it's a weed. Um, it really, uh, it, I mean, because the things we kind of noted earlier with um, the benefits of putting this into a into a farm system, um, it's a, it fixing nitrogen, bringing biomass, and other things. It's designed, you know, it's part of this plant's DNA to build soil. Um, so even if even if you have a poor soil, of course, there's a recommended, you know, uh, type of soil and type of pH they want and things of that sort. But even in poorer soils, uh, you're able to grow this crop because it, it, it can even be invasive. There are places in Kentucky where it's still growing in the ditches from when they grew it back in the 1930s uh, and before. Um, so um, so it, it's fairly you know, simple on that, on that aspect. When it comes to the labor, it's really looking at what type of style and what you are going for. If you're going for biomass and fiber, that'll be one type of setup. If you're going for oil, you know, um, CBD and things of that sort, that'll be a different type of a setup. Um, with the more labor intensive uh, type of a setup, which is for the, for the bud and for the CBD oil, um, there is uh, spurks in which you're going to have to kind of uh, see this thing from what I'm hearing from farmers. You know, of course, there's that if, if you're doing trans, if you're transplanting all clones and you're going to do an acre where well, that's 2000 plants that you have to put into the ground right there. You know, um, so, of course, that that's going to be a labor intensive. But we're, we're, I know farmers that are getting around this by uh, drilling directly into the ground, you know, and kind of catering from from that. There's also the you know the harbor in the um, harvest intensive intensity. Um, you know I knew uh, some white farmers who you know did almost two weeks of 12, 15 hour days, you know trying to get um, as much as this stuff harvest, and it was still some of it they had to leave in the field, and that was with uh, you know a seven, eight you know people work team. Um, so there is an intensity that happens right there to the end for you to be able to cash out that I think it needs to be considered. I think it definitely should be considered, um, um, because right, right there to the end that there are some things you have to look out for, such as, you know, blight and, you know, certain bugs and worms and things that sort that want to eat your plant. There's a certain catering that you have to do just like any other crop, you know? Um, but overall there is, um, it's still considered to be um, more on the labor intensive end of, um, of farming. Um, and so that's why I would really, and what, what I'm recommending for farmers and even practices that I'm taking on for myself is to really start small and build it up to, and to be able to customize a system in which you know works for you. Still there? Yes, thank you. I'm on mute. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, in I that same you? line, I'm talking about expenses. Is there any information coming out from growers that have had real experience that are giving their real numbers for what that total cost is, not just plants, but plant to production? And we're able to see the projected um, profitability numbers at this point. Is there anyone that's giving out that information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can actually, there's um, the, the um, they're white farmers, but there are several um, farmers who were in the first round, the first year of the licensing in North Carolina. This is Whitney J. I'm sorry, I didn't say my name. Um, but there are several farmers who, in the first year of licensing in North Carolina, and the 
the first and second and the first in South Carolina, who they've been able to run those numbers on. Um, those uh, numbers are available through North Carolina State University's extension um, and Clemson University's extension. Those are the two kind of anchor organizations that are working with the licensees in both North and South Carolina, in addition to North Carolina, um, North Carolina A and um, So A and T, North Carolina State in North Carolina, and Clemson in South Carolina. Um, I think South Carolina State as well in South Carolina, but they've been able to start running the the very early numbers on some of the folks who've been producing specifically for oil, CBD oil, um, and. Uh, what their inputs were per acre, what the invet what the cost of inputs per acre and the profits per acre. So I've seen some of those numbers, the input numbers, depending on the, the way that they're growing can vary widely, like Jason was saying. Um, but those, if you go to the website, the um, website for, uh, I think it's a kind of joint website between North Carolina State and North Carolina A&T, if I'm not mistaken, they've published some early numbers. And I'm sorry, I don't know them off the top of my head, but I know that they are housed on the website where they're basically kind of updating and providing very, very early numbers of what some folks are getting from their, their first year and second year crops. I did wanna check in really quick about time. Um, I wanna make sure that we um, get folks down. I know it's Sunday. I'm I want to make sure for folks uh, get their questions answered, but I also want to name that it's currently 6.15. Um, this call is supposed to last till 6.30. Um, I did want to close out with getting input from the folks that are on the phone around like what other topics you would be interested in uh, these, grow, these grow calls covering. And so let's, if we have for the next five minutes, any lightning round of questions that you want to ask, um, Jason with a hard stop at 620 and then we can kind of transition um, into kind of the next part and ultimately uh, in the call at 630. But this has been really, really helpful and great in helping us understand and helping other folks on the phone understand kind of what this this uh, process is like and what um, and what we can expect from uh, from the production. So if there's any other questions from the folks who are on the phone. And you're unmuted. I had, a question. I had a question about the testing that takes place after the hemp is grown. Mm -hmm. um, so I know within the oil and the bud industry, um, all of it has to be tested from uh, basically a state accredited testing facility. Is that the same for um, oil, I mean, for the fiber industry or um, do you have any other information on how to, you know, pass the test, what's needed? Because I know that there are farmers in those areas, California and, and um, Orlando, and I'm sorry, California and Colorado, who have had crops and then they didn't test to be uh, sold legally. So do you have any input on the testing process? Yeah, um, well, in, in, in the Carolinas in particular, you know, and, I, and it might be, I think it's this way nationally, that your in in hemp your THC level has to be below a 0.3. Um, so and once you get you know say you went through the the, uh, the the licensing process, you go um, and you you accept for, for the program. You know you get your seeds, you put them out there. You have to you know you're now a sheriff can come to your land and pull samples anytime. And um, and they don't even have to give you a, a heads up. In which, from my experience, most of the time they do. Um, but um, but that's the only mandatory test. And all the other tests in which I've heard uh, has come from individual contracts. So um, like there's the uh, two five two store here that wants everything, all the CBD levels to be above a sixteen above sixteen percent. You know, all, all the rest of the standards that come with testing outside of the THC being below um, point, um, point 0.3%, um, most of those are dictated by the markets in which you're tapping in and what they're looking for, from my experience. Hey, I had, I had one more question, uh, basically about the go-to-market strategy. This is Marcus Miller. So how are we, so once we grow, the hemp and so forth how are we getting this 
product out to the people who want to buy it and so forth? Is it the same methods that we would take as in like farmers markets if we're selling um, leafy greens and so forth? Or is it like contract based where we have to get a contract to be able to sell this hemp uh, product to various businesses or, uh, or whoever? As of right now, the market is open source. As of right now, you can you can sell it either way. Um, as of, as of as of right now, I I hope it stays that way. Um, I don't know. Um, but as of right now, if you wanted to sell it, you know, uh, you know, in a farmer's market and things of that sort, in a, on the storefront or or contract out, all all of those things are being done right now. And our options depend on kind of where you are and the opportunities that have presented itself um of what to do with that um the numbers um which which i am getting majority of these are coming out of contracts um i do know i haven't spoke with i do know a couple of like dispensary owners and things of that sort and they are paying um and they are paying around 100 to 200 i think the highest he pays is for greenhouse uh flower um it's 350 dollars um so there, it's it's pretty it's, it's pretty as of right now it's pretty open in how you can kind of get it off, um, and and I and I know that there are some entities that are fighting to be not so, um, but I don't think that'll happen in the near future. Any other questions from the group? I know we are closing in on 620. Um, Jason, if you could do um, kind of a, a closeout round of letting people know how they can get in contact with you, what's next steps for kind of your work on hemp um, through Saffon and um, in what ways folks who might wanna be connected or plugged in, how they can be connected or plugged in with you. Absolutely. Well, you can um, you can call me. I'm pretty open that way. Uh, you can email me. My number is 252-916-7511. Again, 252-916-7511. Uh, my email is jlindsay, that's J-L-I-N-D-S-A-Y, at saffon.org. And so you can you can reach me either way. Um, I, the next steps I'm really looking forward to to working with farmers um, on how we can kind of bulk this thing up. Um, I there's kind of a two part you know piece to it. You know, one on one end there's how can we tighten up individual systems so we make sure that something like hemp is is flowing well um, through these systems. And two is how can we bulk up you know collectively so that we can meet the demands of a larger contract that could give us a little bit more longevity, uh, well, secure longevity. Um, so um, those, those are our next steps right right now. Um, working, uh, you know, I'm, I'm open to, you know, uh, coming to farms and things of that sort and seeing kind of where we are. I'm definitely open to, you know, if you want to get on a call or something like that and me and answer any questions or you have any particular parts and you say, hey, can you put some attention here? Uh, I'm definitely willing to kind of work with you in the capacity that that, that you are ready for um, and, and, and open. Um, not not crazy open. Don't call me at midnight, but uh, if it's an emergency, I understand. <laughs> so, um, but, but really open uh, to hear from you all and to learn and, and to see which ways in which my service, you know, through Saffon um, and as a farmer, uh, can be can be used. Are any closing thoughts or comments about um, Saffon's work? If not, then we'll uh, we'll transition. But I did. I'm sorry, we missed that first part. You missed my first part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was calling Tamara to the floor to see if she had any final thoughts or um or things she wanted to add in terms of uh, Saffon's work around hemp and, and our strategy. No, I just want to thank Jason for everything that you shared and, and you too, Whitney. Uh, thought it was a great conversation. And I want to encourage farmers on the call that we can also take baby steps, you know, so 
If we're not ready to all jump in and form a big old co-op, we can just start by two, three, four farmers who want to work together to go after a contract. That's, that's perfectly fine too. If you just want to plant a couple pots and just kind of take it a little bit at a time, I suppose that's good too. So whatever you need for us to do to support what you want to do moving forward, we are here for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Tamara. Um, so yeah, that concludes um, our first our first staff on Grow Series talk. Thanks again to Jason for kind of heading up our first one and really um, helping us better understand staff on's work and ultimately just hip production in general. Um, I did want to let you all know that this is going to be happening every single month, the fourth Sunday of the month. Uh, from 5 o'clock to 6.30 p.m. Um, and will be different topics, different farmers in the network, different partners who will be sharing about um, different crops, different topics that we know from, from our work with farmers that you all are interested in. And if there's a topic that you feel that you, um, you want to share or exchange with farmers about, um, feel free to email me at wjaye at saffon.org. Uh, for the folks who might have received the emails from me to remind them about that call, you can respond to my email or um, to the phone number 404-368-9561. That was in um, the email box, but this will be happening every week. So um, feel free to join us the fourth Sunday from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Next month, March 31st, will be um, us talking about Saffron's work in seed saving. So we will have Ira Wallace, who um, a lot of you know is a sister from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, which is a seed company here in the Southeast um, that focuses on saving, and preserving, um, and holding uh, varieties that are important to southeastern uh, sustainable agriculture. And so Saffron is in the process of dreaming up, envisioning up how we can help farmers deepen their practice of seed saving for folks who just want to seed save to, um, to be able to lessen their dependency on buying from seed companies, but folks who might want to sell for seed. Um, I mean, sell, sell to market, sell to seed saving companies. So Saffron is trying to, uh, you know, figure out how we can, as an organization, support farmers going into that market and really uplift and seed saving as a part of our cultural work in preserving heirloom um, and heritage varieties in the Southeast. So um, Ira Wallace will come and share a little bit about her, her history in seed, seed saving, about um, the, pro the project itself, what we're thinking about and really opening up the floor to get as much feedback and, is, and incorporate as many of your dreams around seed saving that we can. Um, so that is something that we can continue to do as both cultural work in Saffron, but as a, as a organizing tool to help folks be able to seed exchange and share. Um, so that'll be next month, March 31st from five to 6.30 PM, um, fourth Sunday. Um, I did wanna open the floor up before we closed the call to anybody on the phone that has um, ideas or input on topics that you want to see these calls cover. Um, this is this is about bringing you all together around topics that are important to you. Um, so please feel free to share them at this time. Uh, and I co I'll collect them and, and start putting the pieces together on how to move us forward on getting getting the calls organized. Anybody? And you are unmuted. Uh, you can just speak. And if not, if we don't have any ideas, we'll close our first roll call. Thank you guys so very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Very good. Very, very good. informed and very good. Thanks. Very good. All right. Good night. Yeah, good. good night. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.